Hey everyone, glad you could join us tonight. I'm Nick Toma. And I'm Candace Kelly. It was the worst nuclear accident in U.S. history, the partial meltdown at Three Mile Island. And it happened 40 years ago today in Dauphin County. Now, it started around 4 a.m. on March 28, 1979, with a failure in a non-nuclear part of the plant. Then a chain of events caused a reactor to shut down. Due to instrument malfunctions, workers took actions that uncovered the core, which then overheated. According to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, 2 million people were exposed to radiation. Activists say nuclear energy is dangerous and they want the plant to shut down. One woman who was visiting that area 40 years ago became an anti-nuclear activist. What are you going to do with the radioactive waste? We are mortgaging, we are hawking our future for the illusion of what is being created by the nuclear industry. And this morning, a vigil was held around the time of the nuclear accident. Two dozen people came together to remember and raise concerns. That crisis lasted five days back in 1979, and every year since, a group has gathered there to mark the moment when things went wrong. Looking back at what happened 40 years ago, chaos and confusion. It's important to commemorate an event that caused South Central Pennsylvania to almost become uninhabitable. We were within 30 to 45 minutes of a full unstoppable, uncontained nuclear class nine meltdown. So we're gonna take a, uh... And at today's visual outrage over how the facility is still causing problems, activists urging lawmakers to not bail out TMI, which is set to close this fall. The 40th anniversary of the TMI incident comes as state lawmakers debate plans to assist the nuclear industry in Pennsylvania. Opponents of the proposal call it a bailout, and those discussions come as nuclear power plants face some tough competition from the natural gas industry and renewable energy sources. Lead I team reporter Andy Mahalchik joins us now in the studio to explain what this is about. Andy? Well, Nick and Ken, the owners of two of five nuclear power plants here in Pennsylvania, Beaver Valley in western Pennsylvania and TMI near Harrisburg, say they may have to shut down those facilities unless state lawmakers step in. There is concern that if those plants and others in the state close, it would add to the increased carbon emissions from fossil fuel-based facilities that burn coal or natural gas. No doubt about it, the debate is fueling up even as we speak. Should the nuclear power industry in Pennsylvania be left to fend for itself? Some say that could lead to economic and environmental problems across the Commonwealth. That's going to have an impact. That could raise the cost of energy by close to $800 million annually here in Pennsylvania. More on the backs of, of, of the ratepayers. Senator John Udichak argues that something has to be done to assist the nuclear energy industry in the Commonwealth, pointing out that about 1,000 people work at the nuclear power plant near Berwick. The only way to do that is to keep nuclear in the fleet, in the portfolio, and I also want to incentivize other industries. I want to incentivize wind, solar, waste coal, and the gas industry through methane capture. House Bill 11 was introduced two weeks ago. It calls for rewarding energy generators that do not emit carbon dioxide. It could translate into a rate increase for taxpayers. But supporters insist the loss of the nuclear industry in Pennsylvania would be devastating to the Commonwealth's economy, the loss of about 16,000 jobs. They are good paying jobs that simply cannot be recreated once they're gone. Talon Energy, which owns and operates the nuclear power plant near Berwick, released a statement in support of House Bill 11. It reads in part, it not only includes price caps to mitigate the cost to consumers, but also helps to avoid more than $700 million in increased energy costs each year. But opponents to the bailout are lining up. They include anti-nuclear activists, the AARP, and business groups. They argue that if House Bill 11 means investing in outdated and inefficient power plants, it will only benefit profitable companies and their shareholders. That debate is sure to intensify in the weeks and months ahead. Andy Bahal, Chicago Eyewitness News. All right, Andy, thank you. Oh, we had lots of sunshine to start the day. Not the case so much anymore. Chief Meteorologist Josh Odell is on the rooftop. Hi, Josh. Hello, Candace. No, we don't. The sun has gone away, and we better get used to the clouds. We may see the sun Saturday afternoon, maybe Sunday afternoon, but let's not rush our lives. Let me show you the radar from the last couple of hours here. We've been watching these rain showers. They've been here. Uh, some of us may get a little rain tonight. Some of us may not. So if you are headed out this evening, may I suggest you just take the umbrella and once you have it, you may want to keep it close to you for Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Not nearly as cold tonight. We're forecasting lows 
in the 40s. You can track the rain with us tonight or through the weekend. You'll want to use interactive radar and you're going to find it on the eyewitness weather app. Candace, uh, we may have the rain around. Mm -hmm. The same time though, it is going to get warmer. I'll see you downstairs. All right, look forward to hearing more about that. Thank you. A jury sentenced Jacob Sullivan to death for raping and dismembering his girlfriend's 14 year old daughter, Grace Packer, back in 2016. Sullivan pleading guilty to first degree murder for killing Packer. Investigators say that he strangled, dismembered, and then dumped her body in Bear Creek Township, Luzerne County. Hunters found Packer's body in October 2016. After deliberating for three days, a Bucks County jury imposed the death penalty. Grace's mother, Sarah Packer, is already spending life behind bars, behind bars rather, for the role in her murder. The woman accused of killing Pottsville businessman Patrick Murphy scheduled in a New Orleans courtroom today. 25 year old Megan Hall set to come before a judge around three this afternoon for a preliminary hearing. The judge deciding if there is enough evidence there to move forward with charges. Hall remains jailed on $750,000 bail. Murphy was found dead with multiple stab wounds last month in a New Orleans hotel room. Serving our country is a selfless act, but not every military career ends in glory. Some wind up on the streets with a pet as their only companion. St. Francis Commons in Scranton is trying to ease that pain for veterans with animals. Eyewitness News reporter Cody Butler explains. If you walk inside St. Francis Commons on any given day, tails will be wagging. You know, he's my best friend, you know, he's just like my brother or something, you know, he, he makes all the difference in the world. Buddy never leaves his owner's side. Richard McCovey is a Marine Corps veteran living at the Commons. Buddy, his emotional support animal, lives with Richard in the transitional housing facility for homeless veterans. Well, this is a real blessing. I mean, it's a wonderful place to live and there's so many different uh, avenues for help. One of those avenues is the new Curative Companions program, backed by a $10,000 grant from the Robert H. Spitz Foundation. So far in three months, we've used that money towards food, supplies, vet visits, uh, operations. If a veteran comes into the facility and does not have a support animal through the grant, they will work with local shelters to get that veteran the animal they need. I came here, I said, I'm not leaving my dog anywhere. Toya Durham brought her Shih Tzu with her to the Commons about a year ago. With no income, her dog was not up to date with her shots or flea medication. When the grant became available, I was very happy because Sir was able to go to the vet. The program serves five dogs and one cat. Talking to the veterans, the animals provide comfort in a time of need. When him here takes that loneliness away. I could go outside and take the trash out and come back in, you know, and he's wagging his tail and he, like I've been gone all day. In Scranton, Cody Butler, Eyewitness News. And St. Francis Commons takes care of 26 homeless veterans through the Curative Com Companions program. They hope to help bring home more furry friends to help the other former service members. 2018 was one of the wettest years on record for Pennsylvania, and now state officials are preparing for what's to come this season. Officials say we are seeing above average precipitation so far in 2019 with a new season underway, and they are looking at what's expected when it comes to flooding this spring. In the spring flooding outlook, the National Weather Service calls for a risk of minor river flooding in Pennsylvania. Meteorologists say just because we're looking at a risk of minor river flooding, Residents shouldn't let their guards down. Area firefighters sharpening their skills. Next up on Eyewitness News at 6 tonight, the training that's preparing them to fight fires locally and all across the country. Let's take a look at our photo of the day now. Oh, isn't that sweet? <laughs> Linda sent us this adorable photo of her cats hugging. If you have a picture you want to share, we want to see it. Please post it to our Eyewitness News Facebook page.
This is Eyewitness News at 6. You turn on the TV and you see some of those massive wildfires they've had out west. It probably looks like a far away issue. But did you know local wildland firefighters are oftentimes deployed to those areas? And many practice their skills locally too. Eyewitness News reporter Brianna Strunk heads to the National Park to show us what a typical training is like. If you had 45 minutes to hike three miles while wearing a 45 pound weighted vest, could you do it? You cannot run, it's strictly walking. This is the annual pack test in the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area. All wildland firefighters need to participate in and pass this training. And it's designed to make sure that you are physically fit enough. The wildland firefighters say this training is challenging, but they're used to carrying this amount of weight in the field. On the job, they carry water, food, tools, clothing, and other essential supplies in their backpacks. Usually we'll work uh, like a 16 hour shift on a wildland fire each day and you have to take everything with you that you need on the line that day. This test prepares them for the upcoming wildfire season. This time of year, they also conduct controlled burns, fires that are intentionally set. The reasons why we do them are for hazardous fuel reduction to prevent um, further wildfires. Certification allows this group to help fight fires at home, and out west. We're able to travel wherever the, the resources are needed. In Lehman Township, Brianna Strunk, Eyewitness News. Training also includes a classroom component. Yeah, that's where they can practice drills, review some materials, and also refresh their safety skills. Stay with us. Chief Meteorologist Josh Odell has a check on your eyewitness weather forecast, and we'll take you through the weekend coming up.